Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Um, I don't believe I've taught on this in maybe a long time. Um, and it is a significant part of the Bible. The entire, in fact, the largest book of the Bible is the book of what? Psalms. Book of Psalms has 150 chapters in it. No other book has that many chapters in it. Uh, who wrote the book of Psalms? Anybody know? Huh? David did. Uh, not David Cherney, not that David. Not that David. Um, but th the other David, the Judah David. Uh, yeah, he wrote most of those. Um, you can find... His name plastered on some of them. It'll say a Psalm of David. Not in this Bible. This Bible doesn't have it for some reason. But a lot of the Bibles will have a Psalm of David and so on. They'll, they'll put it there in the words. And um, so we're going to learn about that tonight. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about what is the right kind of music. Uh, to worship the Lord with and, and is and is it possible that you could sing or try to sing the wrong kind of music to the Lord? Uh, that's a very it's it's sort of like the you know the argument of what is beautiful and what's ugly. I may not be able to, to define ugly, but I can see it. I can tell it when I see it, okay? I know when I'm looking at ugly, and I know when I'm looking at something beautiful or something pretty. And um, so it would be hard to define exactly what meter, what harmony, what melody, what tone color, uh, what rhythm constitutes not the music that you probably should not try to sing in church. It'd be hard to do that. But if you heard it, you probably could go, you know, I just don't think that belongs in the house of God. My, um, I think it was my mother who, who told me this. Um, she had visited a church, I think at Lake of the Ozarks, <laughs> Uh, with two of her friends, they were cleaning a house out there. And so they went to this church. They didn't know anything about it. And I think that the, the praise band was singing, uh, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. And they're like, that's not church. That's not a church song. Now, do you find anything offensive in the words of that song? No, not really. Not really. Uh, so why couldn't it be sung in the house of God as a, as a song? Why, what, why couldn't it be? I'm asking you guys. Why couldn't that song be used in the house of God during a service? Yes, ma'am. Doesn't say a word about God. Not one word. All it is is like an uplifting song that anybody could sing, wave to you and say, have a good day. Anybody can do that. Okay. Yes, Chris. Then again, the Spirit of the Sky talked a lot about the Spirit of the Sky that I wouldn't put in church either. <laughs> it's a different spirit. You know what occurred to me that I think I brought this up, but that song by Juice Newton, Just Call Me Angel of the Morning. And that I, the morning angel in the Bible is Lucifer, Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Yeah, and I'm like, because I walked in the gas station and they were playing that on the, and, I, and it just hit me. And I'm like, okay, yeah. And we, so we're not singing that one either, okay? Uh, but I can tell you, you know, I've been in church all my life. And I can tell you that some people have sang some pretty wacky stuff. Uh, as, and not, not, maybe not necessarily uh, for uh, congregational singing, but um, 
for a special. And you'll always have some, some mom or dad who thinks their little angel daughter can do no wrong. And so she brings in some love song that she hears on the radio and tries to adapt that to make it sound like it's coming from Jesus, but it's not. And the pastor, he can't say anything because they'll get mad and uh, they'll call him a dictator and they'll try to run him out and he'll lose his job and all this stuff. And so it's just, you have this, un they're, they're singing this for a revival service. And you'll just have this uncomfortable moment where this girl's up there singing, swaying her hips around, acting like she's, I don't know who's, who sings? Who sings? I don't know who, what woman sings anymore. Give me some women singers. Huh? I want to say Loretta Lynn, but that shows my age. Shows the last time I listened on the radio. Uh, anyway, up there, up there putting on a show for everybody, pretending now that this is for God. And it's not. And, um, you know, like I say, the mom and dad won't do anything about it because they think their angel can do nothing wrong. And, and uh, it would cause a church split. And I've, I, listen, I've seen churches fight over less, but I will tell you that it is important, I believe, uh, to sing the right music, to play the right music. And uh, one of the things that I learned and was instilled in me as a child by my mother uh, was that there is a difference between what goes on in this room during a service and what goes on, say, at home I had an upright piano, mom and dad got me, and I practiced on, I played that piano every day. And uh, I played a lot of ragtime music. And that's how I learned what to do with my left hand and my right hand, uh, and I carry that with me today. Um, but the thing was, rag, most ragtime music, when ragtime was popular around the turn of the century, uh, it was played in bars. And generally, um, Houses of ill repute is where it was played. Scott Joplin, uh, he's the guy I liked, and he was classically trained. He was one of the few ragtime pianists that actually knew how to read and write music. And so that's why he became so popular, uh, was because uh, he could write, he could put his music down on paper, and he had a publisher that sold practically all of his music during his lifetime. Uh, he died of syphilis. He died of syphilis, if that tells you what kind of lifestyle he lived. That's, but that's, I, anytime I would sit at that piano and before church and start to play one of those songs, my mom would go, eh. And uh, yeah, that's just, like a, that's just like a mama lion going, Rrr. and I knew exactly what it meant. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask God to lead our thoughts. Our minds and our hearts together tonight as we study this subject. Let's, let's, let's put it in a way where we're going to praise God with it. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the gift of music. And Lord, you know what excites me. You know, Lord, that there's just something in, in the teaching tonight that I just can't hardly wait to get to. And when I saw this verse, God, you know what it stirred up in me. And Father, I love you. I love music. I love to play music. I love to sing music. And God, I would rather sing your song, sing it for you, and for the uplifting of God's people than any other kind of music, sing it to any other crowd, and it wouldn't matter how big the crowd would be. God, I just love playing your song. I love the Lord's song. I love when God's people sing. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would always bless this church with good gospel music that worships you, that puts you in the right and proper place in our lives and in the church and in this world. And Father, I pray, dear God, Lord, that there would just never be an argument or a contention, Lord, in this place about what's the right music and what's wrong father and that we would never never bring something inside 
the walls of this church during the service that did anything except glorify you and honor you. Uh, not only to this crowd, but to the world. Anybody in the world who is listening to this service tonight, Father, that we would never, ever bring reproach upon the name of Jesus with our songs. Bless us and give us understanding of your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Now let's, I have verse 19 up here, but let's back up a little bit and get the context now of where Paul is going with this. And um, uh, after we get done with this, um, then we're going to get into uh, really what is what most people go to study in Ephesians 5, and that is the relationship of the wife and the husband and children, and everybody in the, everybody in the church is included in this. Uh, but we'll get to that uh, maybe later on. So he says, um, let's go back to verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So number one, understand that the days that we live in right now are evil and even, even to the extent that many churches have become corrupt in their, in their doings, in their doctrine, in their music. They, that corruption extends into what they would refer to as praise and worship. Uh, but it, it bears little resemblance to actually worshiping God because God said that he must be worshiped in spirit and in truth. And uh, I mentioned this before, but it falls into this context. How could your praise band worship God in truth if they are not, in fact, saved or born again or right with God? Such is the case of, I've mentioned this, a friend of mine who uh, was on staff at the church. He's now pastoring a different church, but he was, at, he was uh, the superintendent of the Christian school. It was a very large Christian school, and the church was a big church. And he said, he called me, we were talking one day, he said, Mike, I don't even know the names of the people who are in a worship team. So I couldn't tell you who they were. And I'm on the staff. I sit in the meetings and vote on different things. And he said, I couldn't tell you who they were. We hired them. And I went, are you kidding me? And he said, no. And he knew that wasn't right. And uh, I've, I witnessed it with my own eyes. Uh, back years ago, we took Matthew and Caleb to... Um, uh, Branson, and uh, we went to this uh, Baptist church there in Branson, and uh, their, their pastor had just resigned. They had an interim preacher there, and um, I have to tell you, he, he didn't do a bad job with his message, I have to tell you that. But they had a praise band up there on the stage, and they were doing little, their little thing, you know, leading everybody in songs that no one knows. And so, uh, during the message, Caleb was getting our attention. He said he had to go to the bathroom. So Lisa said, uh, won't you take him to the bathroom? I said, well, okay. So I took him out in the foyer. Well, there's the praise band out in the foyer. Just talking it up, laughing. You know what they're doing? They're waiting on their cue. Their cue then to go back out on stage and lead everybody in this soft music. So you can get people down at the altar at the end of the service. And I looked at that and I'm going, that ain't right. How come the preaching is for everybody else, but it's not for the people? If, if it's for anybody, it ought to be for the stage first and work its way down the pews. That's my interpretation of it. If anybody needs the preaching, it ought to start up here and work its way down. Um, no, I can't say this. It's a sort of private conversation I had with somebody whose family was, was in the gospel music business. Um, I, I will say this. I told them that any time they came to our church, I made it a point to preach right at them. And they, they said, why? I said, because I, I know a little bit about the life that you're 
that you're on, you're on the road, you're away from your home church, and you're sitting in churches because you were paid to be there and do your concert thing, and, um, and you're hearing all kinds of garbage coming from pulpits all over this country. And I said, uh, I pray about it, but uh, I a lot of times will direct some of my preaching right to them, and I've seen at times several of them down on the altar. And... Um, because that kind of lifestyle for, for somebody who is married to go around 300 nights out of 365 nights in a year and be gone from their family singing full-time gospel music in these big gospel music venues, uh, that kind of life, I, I know I couldn't do it. There's no way I could do that. And um, there, has, there is always uh, things that happen with various groups uh, some of their singers will uh, fall out. Uh, one, I will tell you this, there was a group back years ago in the 90s called the Bishops. And it was a son and it was a man and his two sons. And boy, they were good. They were a trio, family trio, good harmony. One of them could sing real high. And the dad carried the, the baritone and the, one of the, the other boys sang the lead. And buddy, they were good. And they, I mean, they had them a bus and they went all over this country. They did the gospel music festivals everywhere, quartet convention. I mean, they were just selling records right and left. And the dad caught one of his sons in the arms of another woman while they were at some place singing and found out that they, he had been carrying on affairs. And he went, he, he canceled, he called his agent, canceled every one of their upcoming concert dates, drove the bus home, put a for sale sign on it, put, a, put up a different website saying that they no longer are singing in churches. And he, he was reported to have said uh, to his boys, to his family and to some other people, uh, I got in this thing to bring honor and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm not about to have my family bring reproach to the name of Jesus and us go around and act like there's nothing wrong. We're not going to stand in somebody's church and pretend like we're spiritual singing these songs and then uh, go out and do that and try to cover it up. And he, I was like, wow. Uh, that kind of integrity you don't find. But anyway, let's read this. Ephesians 5, uh, let, uh, let me go down here. Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is and I would say to anybody that if you have a question in your mind about what music to listen to and what music to stay away from the best place to go is to the Lord I may not be able to answer your question I may not be able to specify what is right and what is wrong but I guarantee you, according to this verse, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. I guarantee you, you seek God and he'll start, he'll start culling things, not just music, but just things in general in your life. If you will ask God, God, what's right? What's wrong? Uh, God, I got some gray areas. You put them in the black or white column and I'll follow that. And then he says in verse 18, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Listen to me. Drunks sing songs, don't they? I mean, um, oh, um, country music star married to uh, Tammy Wynette. Who, George Jones was probably the biggest alcoholic singing in his time. I mean, he was a bad drunk. There's a story about him getting on his lawn tractor and riding it down the road headed to the bar because Tammy had hid the keys to all the cars and trucks that they had so he couldn't leave and go get a, uh, a drink of liquor. And so he got his lawn tractor out and rode it down the road so he can go get a drink. True story. By the way, um, Vestal Goodman of the Happy Goodmans led George Jones to the Lord before he died. Okay, that much I know. Uh, but... You have guys like Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash was a coke freak. So was Merle Haggard. Merle Haggard was constantly snorting cocaine before every concert, probably after every concert. Uh, these drunks, I'm just telling you, drunks sing songs too. Okay? 
And usually the kind of songs they sing do not bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 19. I want you to, I want you to look at the language being used here at the very beginning, speaking to yourselves. Now, this does not mean, and, and we have scripture to back it up, this does not mean that this verse implies that we cannot sing in the house of God during our church service. That would be against what the scripture actually says. And I got a verse I'm just dying to tell you. Because when I found it, I, man, I cried. Because I'm going, oh, I can't wait for this. I'll tell you what it is in a little bit. So, so, some have used this verse, isolated it from the rest of the scripture to say that like public singing in the church or special singing or whatever is not allowed by God. God said, speak to yourselves in Psalms. And so they, they, they isolate this verse from the rest of the scripture and they try to make it like it's wrong to sing music or like the Church of Christ does to use instruments in the singing of that music. God himself wrote it in the scriptures to use the instruments. So why do they have a problem with it? I don't know. But anyway, let me just emphasize this for that reason. Speaking to yourselves, it is, it will always do you good to get alone with God and sing. Always do you good. Sing, get alone, you and God, when you're at work, or you're at home, or wherever you are, get in the car, get some good, good, good Christian music on there, and sing, and sing, and sing, and sing. I believe that music can lift the soul, it can bring comfort. Uh, it can bring happiness to a sad, lonely heart. Um, I used to, the, that upright piano that I had, I broke the E flat above middle C. I broke the hammer because I used to just really hit that thing. And uh, you'd be surprised how many songs need that E flat in there. And I never did get it fixed. But um, one of the reasons why is playing the piano for me has always been uh, something that I can use when I'm frustrated, when I'm sad, when I'm depressed, when uh, maybe things aren't right. And um, that really helps to take a lot of it away. And I am very, very thankful uh, that I have that in my life. And so breaking that E-flat hammer was probably one of those instances where as a teenager I was frustrated. Uh, you feel like you're alone and uh, nobody understands you and... Undoubtedly, I just went to town on that piano and broke that E-flat hammer. But he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we're going to look at the dictionary or the, um, the root of these words, find out where they come from. We're also going to look at scriptures. And then it says, singing and making melody where? In your heart to the Lord. So again, this is not a, a commandment saying that we cannot do this in the house of God. But it is more of a commendation to all of us to when we are alone, if you pray, pray. But then, while you're alone, won't you sing? Sing, why sing? Well, the psalm says, sing to the Lord. Who's your audience? The Lord. He's the one hearing you. So number one, doesn't matter how bad or good it is. Okay? If you can't carry a tune, sing to the Lord. And 
one of my dear buddies has now gone on to, the, to be with the Lord. He was one of the group of uh, the special needs gentlemen that started to come to our church years ago. His name was Eddie. And Eddie, um, even though he was handicapped and couldn't really speak, uh, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't unlearned by any means. He knew exactly what was going on in his life. And he, he was raised in a Christian home. And when his parents died, he went into this facility out here in uh, Hem- or, uh, Mappaville. But anyway, he used to sit back there. And when we'd sing, he'd just sing. He'd just open his mouth and let stuff. And we couldn't understand him. He didn't always hit the right notes. Sing, Eddie. Sing, man. Sing to the Lord. And I got the privilege of preaching his sermon when he died and preaching his funeral and I told everybody let's sing let's sing in honor of Eddie because he always sang to the Lord there's no doubt about it he was sitting back there he wasn't trying to impress anybody he didn't care who hurt him he just was going to sing to the Lord and our church enjoyed that so speaking to yourselves in psalms hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord so first of all what is a psalm a psalm The word psalm and the word psaltery, psaltery, I think are related together. I think that's one of the things that I saw here. This is from uh, Etymology Online. And etymology just basically tells us the root of the word, where it came from. A psalm is a sacred poem or song, especially one expressing praise and thanksgiving. It comes from an old English root psalm with an e uh, or psalm um, partly from old french i'm not going to pronounce any of those and partly from church latin psalmus from the greek psalmos which means song sung to a harp now do we have a harp player in our church technically yes Matthew, the guitar is basically the same principle as a harp. You're plucking strings in order for those strings to sound out certain notes, just like on a harp. Uh, Technically, a piano is like a psaltery. It is hammering those keys, hammering those metal strings, and making the sound come from those strings. Um... Let's see here. Originally, performance on a stringed instrument, a plucking of the harp, and so on. Uh, Let's see here. Play on a stringed instrument, a pull or a twitch is the etymology of that word. When we look in scriptures, we get basically the same identification or the same definition, the same meaning. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 7. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm. Notice what this psalm was for. It was to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. So number one, this is not, I don't think this is the first place you find psalm, but it just stuck out in me that this then defines what this psalm was doing. That David wrote and delivered a psalm for the specific purpose of thanking the Lord. God gave David a gift of not only having the ability to play the harp well, and not only the ability to sing well, God gave David the ability to write music and to write songs. I have tried. I do not have the ability. I, I have, uh, I, I always have different melodies that I don't think I've ever heard before going through my mind. Sometimes they'll just show up and I'll think, boy, that's a neat little tune there. But I don't have words to put to it. And, uh, so I just am really not a songwriter or, uh, a, a composer of any kind. But I like to take what has been written and what has been composed and learn it as best I can and and sing it and play it. That gives me pleasure 
and I enjoy singing it to the Lord. Verse 8, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make his deeds known or make known his deeds among the people. All of this is bound in the idea of what a psalm is intended for. Sing unto him. Who? God. Sing psalms unto him, God. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Notice that we don't sing psalms to Roy. We have no songs in our hymn book with Roy's name in it. Praise ye the Roy. Praise ye. We don't do that. There's nobody who deserves the praise except the Lord. Amen? I don't, I don't sing songs to give honor to people. And I don't like, and I've been in preacher's meetings, camp meetings, where they did nothing but days worth of... of um, Men pleasing and men worship and praising, giving praise to various men, great men who have preached the gospel uh, now and in days gone. I just, I just do not feel comfortable around that. Uh, I think it's right to tell people that you love them, you appreciate them, and you might even give gifts to people. But I have, I've, I have seen men be glorified way beyond their, uh, their right to be glorified. And I'm just not comfortable with that. Verse 9, sing unto him, sing songs unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. All of these are what should be expressed in what we call gospel music or Christian music or psalms. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart, and this goes to, glory ye in his holy name. This goes to, um, when you worship God, you worship him in spirit and in truth. One of the commandments is that you don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Don't use God's name in a, in, in a vain way or to express some sort of vanity. His name is holy. And when we sing his name, we ought to sing it that way, in a holy, reverent manner. Now, there's some music out there, I don't know what it's called. But basically, it almost sounds like a beast growling. Some guys, I think, um, I want to say like Marilyn Manson style music. I listened to one Marilyn Manson song one time and I'm going, Lord, clean my ears out. It was nothing but roaring. And it's basically, I don't know how to define something sounding like devils from hell, but it sounded like devils from hell. And, uh, there, believe it or not, there are so-called Christian bands that sing like that. I was going to have one here. That's how I know that. Um, that kind of song, I do not believe, gives reverence to God. It does not glorify Him, and it just doesn't sound holy. Okay? Glory ye in His holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. See, this is in the heart. And let me just say this, the rules apply, what Jesus said. If what you have in your heart is worldliness, filthiness from this world, and so on, that will be expressed out of your mouth. It will come out of you. It'll come out in your speech, and it'll come out in the music that you sing, and the music that you listen to. Um, so when he talks about the heart... Verse 19 here, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then here, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. There's an agreement here that that music will reflect 
what is in the heart of those who sing it. And um, I mean, there I've I've sat in uh, meetings uh, with other churches and um, heard some of the younger pastors say that amazing grace, how sweet the sound and shall we gather at the river and rock of ages just will not bring people to church anymore. So it's about time that we switch out of that old forgotten music and bring in some new stuff that people will, uh, that people can relate to when they come to church. And that was their whole purpose. Well, I wouldn't say that's their whole purpose, but that's the excuse that they gave for why a church should get rid of its hymn books, throw them out, don't sing that stuff anymore. Uh, or I, there was one time, there was a, I can't remember if it was at camp or what, or one of the quarterly meetings that we went to, and a guy just in rebellion, he was told to sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, and he just, he wretched it. It was awful. And he did it out of rebellion, because he didn't want to sing it, he didn't want to do it, he didn't want to lead everybody in it. And his idea was that that kind of music just won't bring people in anymore. Well, listen, we're not having church here at Field Pews. I mean, I'd love it if more people come. But coming to God's house is not to glorify a man's sinful ways and his sinful lifestyle and to bring honor to that. Coming to church and doing what we do is to seek the Lord and honor Him and give Him the praise. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, in fact, I have that in my notes, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I learned this lesson the hard way years ago when I first became pastor here. I was. I was going to bring that music in. I was going to change a bunch of stuff because I was thinking like all these other guys are thinking. We got to change everything. If, we can, if we're going to expect people to come in here, then we're going to have to make a bunch of changes to satisfy their lust and their demands. No. If you glorify Jesus and honor Him, He will do the drawing of people to Him. It's not my job. Not my job. And I would say that as far as this church is concerned, I think God has done a good job of bringing, drawing people to Him through this church. Amen. Amen. I mean, I don't like saying it because it sounds like I'm glorifying me, but I'm not, because I didn't do it. I'm telling you, God did it. God did it. And uh, if you don't believe me now, when we get to heaven, I'll say the same thing. God did it. Amen. Uh, Psalm 81, verse 1. Sing aloud. Un what? Sing aloud. Now, we have one verse saying, speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. Okay? That is, it's the difference between praying by yourself to God from your heart you're not speaking it out loud. You don't need to. God knows what's in your heart. It's the difference between that and say, if I ask somebody to lead in prayer, they, are, they must do it aloud to where people can hear them. There's nothing wrong with that, leading in a prayer. Solomon did it. The dedication of the temple, Solomon led everybody in prayer. And he prayed unto the Lord that God would bless his house here, knowing that God is bigger than the entire universe and the heavens cannot contain him. And yet we've built this little bitty house and we do ask God to come into this place. And God came into that place. The, the Bible's clear on that. So there's nothing wrong with singing out loud. That's what aloud means, singing out loud. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with letting your voice be known and heard. Uh, if you've got a voice, sing it. If, it. if you don't like the sound of your own voice, sing it to where you can hear it, at least. But sing it out. 
Let your voice be heard. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise. Now, if I could point my finger to anything in the scriptures that would define the core of what makes gospel music gospel music, it's this word joyful. Now, um, heavy metal, grunge rock, rap, um, I don't know all the names anymore of music. Those are not joyful songs. They're not joyful. They are, let me explain something, uh, give you a little lesson in music. Uh, I was taught, uh, e even in elementary school, I remember this. There were five basic parts to music. I don't, know, I don't know if I remember all of them, but number one is the melody. That's the most important part. You can sing the melody without anything else. You don't need instruments. You don't need a choir behind you singing harmony. You can just sing the melody. Okay? That's the most important part of every song. Any and every song is the melody. Singing, and in fact, he says here, singing and making melody in your heart. God knows this. God invented it. So the melody is, like if I were going to sing Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That's the melody. If I were going to sing harmony, it would sound like this. I'm going to sing bass. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now, how does that sound? It needs help, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, when I was with a quartet in college, we, we were cooped up in this van for seven weeks. Me and these other singers, three guys. And our bass singer, he was a great guy. I loved him. Doug was a great guy, and he was an awesome bass singer. He had a natural bass voice. But he would, he would sit in the van while we're traveling for hours, headphones on, he's listening to cathedrals, and he's singing the bass part. So we're just in the van, you know, minding our own business, and all of a sudden, here comes Doug blowing out this bass part. And that's all we hear. And finally we go, Doug! That's enough! Stop! Because that's all we heard was his... And yeah, it's a good bass. Okay? But that's all we heard. So, melody. Then, harmony. Okay? And let me just do this very quickly. Okay? There is resonance and there is dissonance. Okay? That's melody. That's melody. If I add harmony, all the notes fit together, don't they? Doesn't work, does it? That's dissonant. The, the harmony does not fit the melody doesn't go together and so it's like the scratching of a chalkboard or scraping a fork on a plate or with me I don't like wood in my mouth don't give me a popsicle I will not I will not eat it I hate wood in my mouth I can scratch a chalkboard all day long but I, I don't like wood in my mouth to me that's like singing or playing Notes that do not match the melody. So there has to be harmony there. And the harmony has to be harmonious. They have to work well with the melody. So melody, harmony. The next would be what? Anybody take a guess? Rhythm. Rhythm. Songs have rhythm. Now, I uh, used to know a preacher. You would know him if I told you his name. Back years ago, he was very strict 
And he told me, Mike, if the music moves the foot before it moves the heart, it's wrong. Well, that's just in the, that's a thing that some preacher made up. That's not in the Bible anywhere. And my goodness, there is no such thing as a song that doesn't have rhythm. There is no such thing. Amazing Grace has rhythm. Okay? Uh, sweet at Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. That has rhythm to it. And the rhythm is a little bit faster and a little bit different than Amazing Grace. Um, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. That's got faster rhythm, but it's got rhythm. It has an on beat and an off beat. On, off, on, off. And that's how you play it. So a song has to have rhythm. However, um... There is no doubt in my mind that some musicians and some churches will use an extremely fast rhythm to, um, what's the words I want to use? To inject into the listener, oh, how can I say this? To ramp everybody up, to get them amped up. Okay, and so they will say, boy, the Lord was really in our service tonight. Amen. No, it wasn't. It was the drums. It was the drums. And uh, David and I had a talk before we ever got drums. And I told him what kind of what I wanted. And he, he said he could do that. And I tell you, he has, he's like fallen right in with what I'm hearing in my head. He's playing it. He's doing a good job. Okay, you don't hear the drums taking over the harmony or the melody and that's important now some would say drums are not supposed to be in a church that's not quite scriptural there are percussion instruments mentioned in the book of psalms okay uh and and how are you going to get around this praising with the timbrel and with dance how are you going to get around that one okay now we don't dance Okay, I've never seen, I've seen it out in Kenya, okay, and it was done well, but I've also seen it out in Kenya where it was done specifically to, uh, to give everybody a push in the service, and then they would say, well, that was the Lord that did that. No, it wasn't. You, you amped up the rhythm, you got everybody moving, and you called that Spirit-led revival. It has nothing to do with the Spirit. Okay? So I think it can be too fast, too. Uh, especially when it goes on and on and on and on. I've, I've seen services, like charismatic services. Uh, uh, the snake handling services. The music is what amps up these guys that are picking up these snakes. And they get literally almost like hypnotized by the... Because somebody is playing the drums very, very fast. It, it, almost, it almost reminds you of... of oh, I don't know, let's see. Uh, some sort of pagan ritual or some sort of uh, African ritual where the, the beat of the drum gets everybody into a frenzy. It's done. It works. Okay, there's no doubt about it. So the rhythm has to be there in order for it to be a song. But the rhythm should not crowd out the harmony or the melody. And then we have tone color. That's number four. I can't remember number five. Tone color. Um, give me a color that looks sad and bleak and depressing and black gray okay there are songs that when you hear them you're going that's very dark very dark okay give me a color that's that says hi i'm happy everybody's gonna say yellow yellow pink okay uh bright oranges you know 
bright green, whatever, okay, bright reds, all of those. There is tone color, in, just as there is color in vision, there is color in sound. And it goes by the tone. You can listen to a song and say that's got a happy, joyous sound to it. Um, you know, can you imagine uh, ACDC singing Amazing Grace? Nope. 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 They, they deserve to sing Highway to Hell because that's, they that's where they're going. Some of them are already there. Uh, but tone color is how the, how the music sounds is it very dark is it very depressing is it very bleak uh, or does it uh, does it make a joyful noise unto the Lord and basically the difference is the difference between major and minor chords if I did um that tone color is bright That's dark. Now, there are some songs in our hymn book that have minor keys in them. And those minor keys will match, I guarantee you, they'll match the lyrics or the, the purpose of the song. Uh, there are some songs that we sing to the Lord that reflect uh, maybe our, our spiritual place at the time. And we sing them because that's how we're feeling. We still sing it to the Lord. Uh, I can't remember the fifth part of music, so maybe you can look that up. But uh, he says here, sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel. There is a percussion instrument right there. It's a tambourine. Okay, It has a beat to it. And it has these little... These little pieces of metal in there that jingle, jingle, jingle. And um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Notice that he says, take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel. And a timbrel has a bright sound to it. Okay, it's not a gong. It's a high sounding timbrel. It has a, has a high pleasant sound to it. The, notice this phrase. The, here's another word here. The pleasant harp. Pleasant harp. Playing the guitar or the harp or the piano with a pleasant melody, pleasant harmony, pleasant rhythm, pleasant tone color. It is pleasing and, and some people say, well, if it pleases us, it's all about it automatically wrong. No, it's not. Right here, the pleasant harp. Okay, we can hear and tell when a song pleases us. And there is music, God's music. God's music, we don't have to be mad every time we sing it. Amen? It brings joy to me to sing these songs. I love doing it. Uh, the pleasant heart with the psaltery. And a psaltery, I think the modern equivalent of a psaltery would be a hammered dulcimer. Okay? A hammered dulcimer. I think... Uh, it is a stringed instrument, sort of like a harp, but it has a sounding board under it, like a guitar. And you hit the, the strings, the metal strings on it. And that also, I love, I love hammered dulcimer music. I love it. To me, that is a very bright, cheerful kind of music. Uh, blow up the trumpet in the new moon. The trumpets. Now we have uh, blown instruments. Trumpets, trombones, baritone, euphonium, baritones, uh, bass trombones, tubas are all in the classification of a trumpet. You're, you're buzzing the lips and the sound is altered because of the brass tubes. You use this to change the notes and so on. And the, the flaring out of the bell on it brings the sound out. If you take the bell off of any of those instruments, you can't hardly hear it. For some reason, that bell just amplifies it. Okay? Uh, so we have pleasant harps, we have psalteries, we have trumpets, 
which covers, I guess, all the brass wind instruments in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. And that's just a, that's just a small part. Usually when you get into the upper Psalms, 80, 90, Psalm 100, all the way to Psalm 150, you're going to find a lot of Psalms that deal specifically with praising God. Okay, I, it's just what I've noticed. I don't know why it is that way, but it's what I've noticed. Psalm 95, same thing. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Again, we're directing. We're not trying to sing. We're not trying to put on a show up on the stage. All we're doing is providing you enough cover for your voice. <laughs> yeah, amen. No, we're trying to provide for you uh, the inspiration to sing, okay, with the, with the stringed instruments, with the drums, with whatever it is that we're using up there. We're just trying to provide that for you, but we're not putting on a show. Uh, when I sing up there by myself or with my sister or with Alicia or any of the girls or anything like that, again, we're not, we're not there to entertain everybody. The song, I want it to be good. I want it, I want you to like it. Uh, but the bottom line is, I want God to know that I love him. And I want to express that with what he's given me, which is music. Let us, uh, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Amen. And that's why you shouldn't sing the Lord's song and then the devil's song. I haven't, I have not preached a message on what kind of music. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I used to every now and then go check out the lyrics to songs that were popular. Anymore, a lot of songs that are out now for a young adolescent audience. They are so filthy and so vulgar and so vile. I could not give you some any kind of presentation on these songs because I could not give you the lyrics. I could not tell you the, what the lyrics are. They're so vulgar. Back in the 70s when I was growing up, when I look back now, I can see that they were talking about adult themes and adult things. Now, you don't have to guess. It's very open, very plain. And I, in, I encourage every parent, find out what your kids are listening to. Find out why they're walking around with headphones on all day long. I don't think that's a good idea. It's just my opinion. You raise your children how you want to. But you, you need to know what they are listening to, who they are listening to, because they will be influenced by those singers. Will. I didn't say maybe, might. I said will be influenced. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Let's stand to our feet.